So here we are now outside the entrance gateway to the temple. And first off, we have an image of what it might have looked like in its heyday. And we must remember that no symbol or colour or statue is arbitrary. Everything means something, every item is a thread within a greater tapestry of knowledge. For example, one of the first things we can see is that it is constructed around sacred geometry. The dot at the very centre of those two circles represents the origin point of all things, the beginning of creation, the Big Bang. The two large circles represent the first two primordial states that came out of that original unity, energy and matter, light and darkness, feminine and masculine, the mother and father of creation. Where the two circles overlap, they create that oval shape known of as the Vesica Pisces, which represents the doorway or the birthplace of all things into the physical world. We can see that within these three shapes a perfect equilateral triangle is formed, which represents the law of three, the driving power that is the cause behind all things in the universe. Some of the ancients had a more mystical name for these triadic laws. They called them holy affirming, holy denying, and holy reconciling. To the left and right are examples of the classical pillars of Boaz and Yachim, which you find in Masonic temples. And they supposedly go back to the original temple of Solomon. Hence these two pillars representing this law of duality are a common feature at the entrance to temples. And of course the human itself is a manifestation of a binary system, isn't it? The left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of the body, and the right hemisphere controls the left side. Our vision works via a stereoscopic system, where impulses from the left and right eyes are merged together in the occipital lobe to give us a three-dimensional reality. Do we not also learn by measuring and comparing two things, the difference between what is safe or dangerous, what is useful or not, the light and the dark, what we say yes or no to. We proceed in our lives via comparison, measurement and decision, all of which would be impossible without this dual system embedded within us. Now we pass into the court of Amenhotep III, which corresponds to the viscera and the spine. The viscera are all the internal organs below the heart and lungs. This is really the chemical factory where our physical food and liquid food intake is processed to create the chemicals to be stored in the liver that are then issued to the rest of the body. But it is also where those foods are converted into the energies for us to move, think and feel. The Egyptians considered this part of the human system to belong to planetary level functions and in the mummification process stored these principal organs separately in the four canopic jars which you can see in the bottom left of this slide. The intestines that take up the majority of this space work on blue force, and the spine brain which rejects influences based on our principles is also blue natured in that aspect of its function. When researchers first started investigating the temple and had worked out that it was mapped out according to the human form, they were still looking for more confirmation and had a feeling that because the Egyptians place such importance on the umbilical cord in the birth process that on the eastern wall of this courtyard there should be some reference to the navel. Sure enough, on one of the architrave stones in the centre of the wall were hieroglyphs that stated, it is here, the true site of the birth of the king, where he passed his infancy and from whence he departed, crowned. Now you see it's a very interesting thing about the womb and the umbilical cord because they understood that the human has the possibility of two births. The first from the womb of our biological mother, but the second from our mother, the planet. The first gives birth to us physically, the second electrically. If we can develop ourselves to pass out of this planetary womb and be reborn into the universe. On the western wall we have a series of 13 chariots in the area where we would expect to find the spine. What is very interesting about this is you would expect to find the 12 thoracic vertebrae of the spine in this area. But why a 13th? Well it turns out that the brain matter that runs down the centre of the spine stops at the first vertebrae of the five lumbar vertebrae at the lower end of the spinal column 
and doesn't continue into the other four. Now it's amazing, isn't it, that a few thousand years ago the Egyptians had this type of detailed anatomical knowledge. But you see, theirs was a completely different scientific approach. In our times, in order to see how something works, we cut it up and pull it apart, which of course destroys the very unseen forces and intelligences that give life to that organic form in the first place. The Egyptian science was non-destructive. It always looked to study what unseen laws and principles were at play behind the mechanical action of the physical form. Passing into this next section, we enter the hypostyle hall and find ourselves in the area of the lungs and the heart, filled with 32 columns that have their bases carved with the phases of the moon. We would expect there to be something to do with the color green in this area, and certainly the moon is a growing baby planet, and in ancient history had the color green divinated to it, but it is now associated with the color orange. However, although it is the sun that is the cause of life on earth, the moon is the pendulum of the process of organic life. Think of how the moon causes the tides by its powerful magnetic pull upon the oceans. Shellfish taken from the sea and put in labs in the middle of the desert still open and close their shells in time with the high and low tides in the sea where they were taken from because the electrical signal always comes before the physical result. So the shellfish still respond to that signal even though they are no longer immersed in the actual ocean. However, it fits that the heart and lungs are placed together, as they also work like a pendulum, don't they? The heart pumps blood to the lungs to be oxygenated and have the carbon dioxide expelled, and then it pumps it out to the rest of the body with that vital life-sustaining oxygen and then back again to repeat the process. We can't have one without the other. Now just think for a moment. It does this 24 hours a day for your entire life. The average adult's heart pumps between six and 7,000 liters of blood per day. In the space of a year, it pumps enough blood to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool, which is 2.5 million liters. Now consider for a moment that it does all of this with no rest. They never sleep, for they must keep working while you sleep and have your rest. So once again, what kind of mighty power and intelligence are the heart and lungs a physical manifestation of to be able to do this. We see that also in this heart chamber is the symbol of Leo astrologically divinated to the heart, which indicates that the heart is connected to a sun level power. But where does the sun get its endless power from, that it never needs to rest? Does this not suggest that there must be an even greater source of power beyond our solar system? what the ancients might have referred to as the heartbeat of creation. This next little chamber is housed within the final sanctuary enclosure and corresponds to the throat and vocal cords. It is in this chamber that the five sacred names of the king are written. It corresponds to the emotional centre. The emotional function is in fact the most vital gateway in the realising of a human's full spiritual possibility because it accumulates and stores the fiery energies needed to activate the higher thinking center whereupon one is able to connect directly for oneself to the higher powers of sun and star level influence to give birth inside one's inner temple to a new formation or unseen world's body that will be able to live on after the death of the physical body it is here we also see the image of the bull or Taurus in this throat area, which of course is where it belongs astrologically. On the inner wall there is a very remarkable scene shown at the bottom left of this slide. It is called the scene of the Theogemy, or the marriage to the gods. In it, Amun and the queen Moita Moya, the mother of Amenhotep III, is seated on the symbol for the sky supported by two goddesses, Selkit with the scorpion emblem and Neith with the crossed arrows, whose own feet don't rest upon the ground, denoting the holy spiritual nature of this scene. On the right are Amun's words and on the left is the queen's response. What is being depicted here is Amun 
telling the queen that she shall shortly give birth to a divine king, to a divine being. It is the original Annunciation, as we see in the painting at the top left, which is a Christian artist's visualization of this act. So we see on the wall of an Egyptian temple from 1300 BC, the depiction of something that would later become a central aspect of Christian doctrine. 